Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Mechanisms of Myeloid Immunosuppression, Functional Characterization of the Tumor Microenvironment Using Single and Multiplex IHC, presented by Chris Grange, IHC Specialist, Cell Signaling Technology. I'm Alexis Corrales of Labroots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labroots and brought to you by Cell Signaling Technology. To learn more about our sponsor, please visit www.cellsignal.com. Now, let's get started. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the ask a question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I now present today's speaker, Mr. Chris Grange. Chris has close to 10 years of experience working with a variety of immunohistochemical techniques and technologies. His main focus over this time has been development and validation of IHC-grade antibodies in a number of research areas. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Chris, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you for that introduction, Alexis. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, so I'm going to talk about mechanisms of myeloid immunosuppression and how we can functionally characterize the tumor microenvironment using single and multiplex IHC. So just as an agenda for today, I'll discuss some of the uh, I'll discuss why the tumor microenvironment is so important and some of the key questions surrounding it. Um, I'll briefly talk about some key markers in immuno-oncology and in the IHC space. Um, then I'll talk about two of the most important functional markers of the myeloid suppressive tumor microenvironment. Uh, we'll spend most of the time today uh, discussing the construction of a fluorescent multiplex IHC panel. And then I'll get into a bit about optimization of a dualplex chromogenic uh, assay. And then we'll uh, conclude and there'll be time for some questions at the end. So as most of us know, new cancer therapies are being approved faster than ever. And while many are focused on immunotherapy and antibody-based therapeutics, they all require a deeper understanding of the tumor microenvironment. It has become clear that even small molecule inhibitors can be affected by conditions within the TME, and that understanding these conditions is key to predicting response rates and efficacy of all cancer treatments. The current understanding of the interaction between the patient's immune system and tumor has led many companies to develop biomarker-driven diagnostic tests alongside lead drug candidates. Many of these diagnostic tests today are based in single-plex chromogenic IHC. IHC remains the critical application for understanding the tumor microenvironment, as it allows researchers to detect biomarker expression while maintaining the spatial context within tissues. This is crucial for looking at variables such as co-localization of certain biomarkers, along with the proximity of different cell types to one another. Not only can we simply phenotype immune cells within the tumor microenvironment by IHC, but we can also get an understanding of what compartment they are residing in. I always like to bring up the example of PDL1 in this context, as it is an immunosuppressive marker that can be expressed of many different cell types. A number of assays, for example, Western blot, could tell you that PDL1 was present in these three lung tumors on the right. However, once you homogenize the tissue, you lose the context of that expression. We would not know that PDL1 expression in the lung carcinoma at the top was mostly confined to tumor cells, or that the tumor in the bottom left expressed PDL1 almost exclusively on myeloid cells. Finally, it would be impossible to know that PDL1 expression in the lung on the bottom right was only on T cells within the stroma. In order to perform even a simple single-plex chromogenic IHC assay, highly validated antibodies are required. 
Thank you. I want to quickly showcase a number of immuno-oncology focused targets for which CST has highly validated IHC grade antibodies. I'll start with some uh, co-inhibitory molecules that are expressed on both tumor cells and on immune cells. Here we have a selection of co-inhibitory molecules such as PD-1, TIM-3, and LAG-3, which we know are expressed on uh, T cells, among other cell types, and also markers such as B7H3 and B7H4, which can be expressed primarily on tumor cells. Moving on, we have co-stimulatory molecules uh, in our catalog as well, molecules such as ICOS and GITR and 41BB, which are currently in the clinic and expressed mainly on T-cells, and also the uh, PAN T-cell marker CD3, along with OX40 and its ligand, OX40L. Further, we have some targets which can help researchers understand the crosstalk between T and B-cells. We have the classic uh, T-regulatory marker FOXP3, along with a marker of cytotoxic T-cells, uh, CD8, and some other markers such as CD19, CD40, and CD40 ligand as well. And finally, we have markers of myeloid cells here uh, on this slide. As you can see, we have CD68, which is commonly used as a pan macrophage marker, CD163, which is a marker of immunosuppressive macrophages, uh, CD11C, which is a marker of dendritic cells, along with some other uh, myeloid markers such as CD206, and CD14 as well. So while we have a number of antibodies directed against these key myeloid cell targets, many questions remain with regard to their functional significance in the tumor microenvironment. Questions such as uh, the M1 versus M2 paradigm, uh, CD68, as I mentioned, it's been used as a pan-macrophage marker, but is it truly uh, a marker of all macrophages, and is it marking um, only macrophages? What is the functional significance of the immunosuppressive marker CD163? And then these other markers of myeloid cells, what are their functional significance, and what type of cells are they labeling? So using IHC to phenotype the myeloid compartment of the tumor microenvironment clearly has many advantages and has led to a number of breakthroughs. However, this only gives a snapshot at a fixed point during tumor progression or treatment. The question is, is this a fair way to characterize the tumor given the plasticity of myeloid cells, mainly macrophages? And then finally, how can we determine the functional contribution of macrophages in the middle of this spectrum? So you can see here on the right, I'm just showing the sort of M1-like macrophages on the left versus the M2 macrophages on the right. And using IHC to determine the functional significance of these macrophages that sit somewhere in the middle of this spectrum has been difficult for researchers and continues to be. Um, but one way we can try to understand that is to look at functional markers of myeloid immunosuppression, such as IDO and arginase. So to start with, IDO can suppress immunogenicity in the tumor microenvironment in a number of different ways. They can disrupt calcium signaling and tryptophan metabolism. They can activate regulatory T cells leading to immunosuppression, or it can interfere with T cell metabolism by inhibiting glucose uptake. Uh, immune cells are the main target of tryptophan depletion, as tumor cells have a number of ways to withstand these effects. For example, tumor cells can remodel their cellular metabolism by upregulating several genes which allow improved glutamine and tryptophan import into the cell. And on the right here, I'm just showing a few images of IDO staining. On the top, you can see an ovarian carcinoma, while on the bottom, we have a colon carcinoma. And you can see IDO expression in the um, ovarian carcinoma is mostly in the tumor cells, while in the colon carcinoma, it's mostly on uh, immune cells within the, the stroma and the lamina propria. Uh, moving on to arginase 1, uh, it can be expressed by tumor and myeloid cells and can also lead to immunosuppressive conditions within the tumor microenvironment. Tumor expression of arginase 1 can deprive immune cells of arginine, leading to T cell dysfunction. Arginase also inhibits tumorocytal nitric oxide production by inflammatory macrophages. Expression of arginase by immune cells within the TME can have similar immunosuppressive functions. 
And here on the right, we have some single-plex stains of a human lung carcinoma. Actually, these are uh, both human lung carcinomas on the top and the bottom. And here we see RGNA is mostly expressed by immune cells, and we're not seeing any expression on tumor cells. So now I want to get into the optimization of a multiplex IHC assay, which is fluorescent-based. So there are a number of ways we can attempt to do multiplexing in IHC. Um, I'll go through three of those on this slide. So you can see on the left, um, the first way would be to use a directly conjugated primary antibody. This has some benefits in that you could use uh, the same antibodies raised in the same species to multiplex, but it also has some drawbacks, especially in formalin-fixed paraffin-embedded tissues. FFP tissues generally uh, generate a high amount of autofluorescence, and using this directly conjugated primary antibody method uh, does not provide much amplification at all. So in most cases in FFP tissues, you will not um, you will not get signals sufficient enough to overcome the autofluorescence of the tissue. Another method uh, that people sometimes use would be to use directly conjugated secondary antibodies. Here we, we, we would deposit our primary antibody onto the tissue and then use, use species-specific secondary antibodies conjugated to different fluorophores. In this case, we can only use antibodies of uh, antibodies raised in different species. So for instance, we could use uh, mouse antibodies, a mouse antibody, a rabbit antibody, and then maybe another mouse antibody uh, of a different class. Um, again, we run into the same issues where we're getting, in this case, a bit more amplification of signal, but oftentimes it's not enough to overcome the autofluorescence within the tissue. So this brings us to the technique that we'll be using today, which is a tyramide-based amplification system. And it's currently the best option for multiplexing in FFP tissues. So tyramide signal amplification, or TSA, requires the binding of the primary antibody to the target antigen, followed by incubation with an HRP-conjugated species-specific secondary. Tyramide molecules, which are conjugated to fluorophores, become activated in the presence of horseradish peroxidase and are deposited via a covalent bond onto the tissue. This covalent binding is the crucial step that allows for multiplexing of up to, in our case today, uh, six different antibodies. So a bit more about the TSA assay in particular. As I mentioned on the previous slide, you have your primary antibody bound to your epitope in your tissue. You come in with a HRP-labeled secondary antibody, followed by uh, incubation with the tyramide conjugated fluorophores, which are activated in the presence of the HRP and covalently deposited onto your tissue. At this point, you're going to microwave your slides or uh, perform some type of heating step, which will remove the primary and secondary antibodies, but leave the covalently bound tyramide and fluorophore uh, attached to the tissue. At this point, we can come in with a different primary antibody, uh, again with a HRP labeled secondary, and then a tyramide molecule conjugated to a different fluorophore. And we can continue to uh, run these steps, the primary, secondary, fluorophore, followed by microwaving, and then come in again with another round of staining. Um, and what this does, it allows us to multiplex, not only uh, using a number of different targets up to six, as we're doing today, but also allows us to use antibodies raised in the same species, because between each round of staining, we're stripping the antibody, and then we can come in with an antibody of the same species. So for our immunosuppressive multiplex IHC panel today, I'll talk a little bit about why we selected uh, the targets that we did. So the first target would be CD68, which we're using as a macrophage marker in this case. Um, then we have IDO and arginase 1, which I discussed earlier, which can provide insight into the mechanisms of immunosuppression in the microenvironment. We've also included PDL1 and PDL2, which, as most people know, regulate T cell activation and immune responses and can be expressed on multiple cell types within the TME. And then we'll use pan keratin as a uh, tumor cell marker as well. So, in constructing our um, multiplex IHC panel, 
we need to begin with highly validated IHC grade antibodies. And I'll talk a little bit about how we validate these antibodies uh, here at CST in the uh, immunohistochemistry application. So what we do is we generally start with a number of clones against the same target, and we'll test those on paraffin embedded cell pellets. Uh, the most common model we'll use in an, is an endogenous model, so one um, cell line that endogenous, endogenously expresses our protein of interest and one that does not. And this not only allows us to do an initial, um, uh, initial test to determine if our antibody uh, can bind to the, the target of interest, but it also allows us to determine an optimal dilution with which to move forward on tissue because we want to get to the point where the negative cell line shows no signal and where we still have signal in the positive cell line. And this usually helps us to determine that, that um, optimal dilution to move forward with on tissue. Um, knowing that dilution doesn't guarantee that it will be correct, so the next step would be to do a, a small titration on a known positive tissue, and sometimes we'll actually use a negative tissue as well, so we'll have another level of validation there. From there, we'll move on to tissue microarray testing, and we make all of our TMAs in-house and they usually include uh, 60 to 70 uh, unique tumors, and those will come from eight to nine different tumor types. So every antibody or every uh, human reactive antibody that we release and approve for IHC uh, from cell signaling technology has been tested on you know, up to, or at least, I should say, at least 60 to 70 different tissues prior to um, adding the IHC application to the CST website. And then we'll finish up with either peptide blocking to just do a final level of validation, or for our phospho-specific antibodies, we'll do a lambda phosphatase treatment to prove that they're, in fact, binding to the phosphorylated protein. So once we have our uh, stock of highly validated IHC-grade antibodies, we can move on to the primary antibody titration using uh, the tyramide reagent. So what I'm showing here is our uh, PD-L1 E1 L3N clone being titrated using a uh, tyramide conjugated to the, the Cy5 dye on a positive and negative endogenous cell line. So you'll notice a few things here. You'll notice that clearly the mean fluorescence intensity is highest when we use uh, more primary antibody. But you'll also notice that the signal-to-noise ratio between the positive and um, negative cell line can bounce around a little bit. So we want to consider both of these things, both the mean fluorescence intensity of our positive signal and also the signal to noise in determining which dilution we want uh, to use in our panel. Uh, it's important to note that this, these two factors aren't the only ones to keep in mind, but I think um, it, it's something to look at initially and to kind of determine a, a smaller range of dilution rather than having to do um, this, this huge titration when you're optimizing your full panel. The next step would be to look at each um, to look at each target using each fluorophore. So we're here we're looking at which fluorophores will pair best with each primary antibody. And you can see again with PDL1 on the same cell pellet model, um, Psi3 is giving us the best signal to noise and also the best uh, mean fluorescence intensity per cell, but you can see that FITSI, Electaflor, uh, 594, or Psi 5 um, would also be pretty decent options. Uh, the next step would be to optimize the order of staining, and what we're doing here is we're using um, each antibody in the panel and we're going through the heating steps. So here I'm showing on the left, if this antibody was used first, we would do only the antigen retrieval, we'd stain the antibody, and then we'd look at the slide. If we're using it, say, in the fourth position, we'd go through every heating step, then apply the antibody, and then look at the slide to determine um, the strength of signal in the mean fluorescence intensity and also the signal to noise. And this will allow us to determine if um, the epitopes that we're trying to detect may be affected by multiple rounds of heating. As you can see with PDL1, um, this is kind of a unique target in that with multiple rounds of heating, we get greater and greater signal, which suggests that PDL1 can withstand, not only withstand multiple rounds of heating, 
but also um, the signal gets stronger and stronger and we can infer that what's happening is that the the epitope uh, is continuing to get a little bit more unmasked with each heating step. So once you have your panel to a point you consider optimized, it's important to compare the staining in the full panel to both a single plex to both a single plex stain slide. Or oh, sorry, let me start over. Um, this this is an important slide, and I want to make sure that we we cover it. So once you have your panel to a point you've considered optimized, it's important to compare the staining in the full panel to a single plex slide stained optimally, and by that I mean with only one heating step, which is the antigen retrieval step. And a, uh, and a slide heated the same number of times as the marker in the panel. So, for example, if we were looking at PDL1 in the fifth position here, we would heat the slide that many times, then apply only the PDL1 antibody. So, looking at these two control slides compared to the multiplex slide allows us to validate a few different variables. First, we can see if we are losing signal in the multiplex slide due to steric hindrance. We found here at CST in developing um, the maybe 12 to 15 different panels that we have that uh, the binding of some antibodies can be affected by the order of staining. If that were the case, we would see diminished signal in the multiplex slide compared to both singleplex stains. Um, if you run into that um, phenomenon, uh, we found that just switching up the order of the staining can help. Uh, it requires a bit more optimization but um, in the end, you get a more robust panel that, that gives you um, a truer expression, a truer look at uh, biomarker expression. So in another case, if the epitope were sensitive to multiple rounds of heating, we would see diminished signal in both the multiplex slide and the heated slide and could rule out any steric hindrance issues. I'll also note that I'm showing uh, in this slide our newest, most reactive uh, immunology panel. And you can see the markers in white in that um, multiplex stain section. And I'll provide a link at, at the uh, end of the webinar uh, for more information about this panel. So switching back to our immunosuppressive panel, um, the next step would be staining of control and tumor tissues with your fully optimized panel. So you can see here, uh, this is our immunosuppressive panel stained on a human tonsil, which is a control tissue we use for uh, many of our immuno-oncology targets. And you can see each of the markers is represented uh, within this tonsil, and, um, and the staining is looking strong and specific with each marker. Here we're looking at a tumor tissue. This is a lung carcinoma. And again, you can see all of our markers are present. Uh, we're not really seeing any bleed through or overlap in these signals. And everything seems to be looking good. So to highlight this panel and the, the optimized conditions that we ended up with, um, I'll just leave this slide up for a minute. You can see that PDL2 is paired with uh, Alexa 4 594, IDO with 555, Arginase 1 with FITSI, PDL1 with Sci5. CD68 with Psi 5.5, and finally cytokeratin with Alexapor 350. And this information, again, I'll, I'll provide a link at the end of the webinar that leads to uh, an application note that'll give you a little bit more detail in, in, in regards to the, uh, the protocol. So just some key considerations to keep in mind when uh, optimizing a tiramate but tiramide-based uh, multiplex IHC panel. So all optimization steps must be taken as a whole. So this goes back to where I mentioned that um, looking at just the signal-to-noise um, or the mean fluorescence intensity per cell is not enough. You need to consider all the variables together and how they will mesh with one another. Um, one thing I didn't mention um, yet is the antibody stripping step. Um, these steps each have to be QC'd for each marker. So, for instance, when we were optimizing this panel, we found that, I believe it was IDO, um, you know, when we, when we did the, the general stripping step, which for us is uh, heating 10 minutes in the microwave and citrate buffer, um, IDO wasn't completely stripped. So what we did was we um, 
we changed the buffer to EDTA, and we found that the stripping step was, um, was complete and that 100% of the signal was gone after stripping. So it's important to test the stripping efficacy with each marker. Um, as I mentioned, steric hindrance can be an issue in the order of staining matters. And the key point is that the controls are crucial. It's important to compare to not only chromogenic staining in a single plex setting, but also the single plex um, optimized fluorescent staining and the heated single plex fluorescent staining, as I mentioned previously. So I just want to show a couple images. Um, this is the same image of the tonsil, but you can see on the left, I've broken out into the single channels um, all of the markers that are present. Here we have an ovarian carcinoma. And again, you'll notice um, we're seeing a bit more IDO expression as compared to arginase uh, in this tumor. And here's that lung carcinoma again. And in this case, it's kind of reversed. You'll see a uh, higher expression of arginase 1, which is in green, uh, versus IDO, which is in yellow. And so once the panel is optimized, um, the acquisition of images and image analysis is, is the next step to be performed. Um, this is a bit outside of the scope of this webinar, but I just wanted to mention that here at CST, we use the uh, MANTRA system from Perkin Elmer, and we use the Inf Informed Tissue Finder uh, for our image analysis. And um, again, I'll provide a link at the end of the webinar that will uh, lead you to some posters that we presented and some of the um, image analysis data that we've generated. So now I want to switch gears and talk about dual-plex chromogenic assay development. So of course there are uh, benefits and limitations to dual-plex staining uh, in the chromogenic setting. So as far as benefits go, um, it's more common than fluorescent labeling. It, it doesn't require additional instrumentation such as a fluorescent microscope or image analysis software. Um, chromogenic staining is widely accepted by pathologists. Um, once the slides are stained, they're stable basically forever, whereas when you're staining with a tyramide-based system, um, the slides are good for maybe up to a month, but after that, um, the signal fades dramatically. Um, and there's more solutions available for automation. What I mean by that is we can, um, in most cases, transfer a chromogenic assay to a automated stainer such as the Leica Bond or uh, the Ventana platform much easier than it would be to transfer a manual uh, TSA-based multiplex assay. But of course, there's limitations as well. Um, usually, we're limited to, limited to about three chromogens per panel just because of the way the colors interact with one another. Um, same species multiplexing can be more challenging because the chromogens may not be as heat stable as tyramide is. And in most cases, we cannot use targets expressed in the same compartment, meaning we, want, we wouldn't want to look at something like CD3 and CD8, which are both expressed on the membrane of a subset of T cells, because the chromogens can block each other out and it's difficult to determine where true co-localization is occurring. So some assay, some uh, sorry, some variables to consider in the duplex chromogenic assay. Um, we want to think about the host species. So are we using two antibodies from the same species? If so, we'll have to perform a stripping step in between uh, each protocol. Um, obviously, we need to optimize the primary antibody dilution and the antigen retrieval step. As I mentioned, the stripping step needs to be optimized as well. Uh, the pairing of the chromogens with each of your primary antibodies and the order of staining, meaning which chromogen is deposited first versus which is deposited second. So for this example, I'll be showing um, our CD8 and FOXP3 mouse reactive clones. Um, and these are both rabbit uh, monoclonal antibodies, so we'll have to perform the stripping step uh, in between each protocol. So as I mentioned, the first step is the initial titration of each primary antibody using each of the different chromogens. So here we're looking at our FOXP3 product, and you can see the image in the top right is our DAB optimal, which was previously optimized at 1 to 400. 
this is on a mouse spleen. And you can see I've done a titration here from 1 to 100 to 1 to 800 of our primary antibody using the alkaline phosphatase uh, red chromogen. And you can see that right around 1 to 200 matches, matches up pretty good with our DAB optimal dilution, which was 1 to 400. And here is the CD8 uh, titration in the red chromogen. Again, we had uh, a DAB optimized protocol, which was good at 1 to 400. And this time in small intestine, and you can see that at 1 to 200, the signal intensity and specificity with the alkaline phosphatase red chromogen matches nicely with what we see in the GAB optimal protocol. So after the single plex optimization with both antibodies and chromogens, we need to test the efficacy of our stripping step. So I want to describe the process that was used to determine if our antibody stripping step led to complete removal of the first primary antibody. So I ran the dualplex protocol for each of these conditions. First, I ran the DAB protocol but did not include the DAB chromogen. I only applied the primary antibody. Then I applied the stripping step, in this case citrate buffer heated to 100 degrees C for 10 minutes. I then ran the alkaline phosphatase protocol with no primary antibody. So if the stripping step was 100% effective, then we should see no signal once the assay is complete, as the primary antibody was only applied prior to the stripping step. As you can see in these images, there's still some red signal with both FOXP3 on the top and CD8 on the bottom. Uh, interestingly, when the alkaline phosphatase protocol is run first, followed by DAB, FOXP3 is stripped more efficiently and CD8 less. So if we ran just the dual plex assay without emitting chromogen or the second primary antibody, it would be impossible to know if the stripping was sufficient. So basically what I'm showing here is in the first images on the left, you can still see red signal with FOXP3 and with CD8, showing that our stripping was incomplete. When I switched up the order and ran the alkaline phosphatase first, FOXP3 was actually stripped much more efficiently and CD8 was stripped less efficiently, as you can see in the images in the middle. And then when I run just, um, uh, just the dualplex assay without emitting um, either the chromogen or uh, a primary antibody, uh, we can see nice staining, but we wouldn't know, basically, if um, the antibody was completely stripped because the DAB signal would uh, block out any red signal that might remain um, and be cross-reacting with our first primary antibody. So since this stripping step was not sufficient and did not remove 100% of our first primary antibody, um, I increased the intensity. So what I did was I switched to EDTA buffer uh, for 20 minutes, and this seemed to do a much better job. You can see with FOXP3 on the top left, um, stripping was much better, but still not complete. And with CD8, it was um, essentially 100% stripped. And when we ran the alkaline phosphatase protocol first, as you can see on the right, and the DAB protocol second, uh, we, saw, we saw complete stripping with both FOXP3 and with CD8. The next step would be to optimize the order. So what I did was I ran um, the images on the top show uh, the alkaline phosphatase protocol with FOXP3 run first, followed by the DAB protocol with CD8 run second. And this is on a mouse small intestine on the left and a spleen on the right. And then on the bottom, you can see the opposite. So this is where I ran uh, the DAB protocol with CD8 first, followed by the alkaline phosphatase protocol with FOXP3 second. And you can see that when we're running uh, the DAB first, in that alkaline phosphatase second on the bottom, uh, we get much stronger signal, certainly with our, with our CD8 clone, but it also appears that uh, the, the FOXP3 signal is a bit stronger as well. So in the end, we determined that this was the optimal uh, order to complete the staining and to move forward with our optimized assay.
And so here I'm just showing you that optimized assay. So we use the DAB first with our CD8 clone, followed by the alkaline phosphatase uh, red protocol with our FOXP3 clone. Uh, the initial antigen retrieval step was EDTA for 20 minutes at 100 degrees C. And the stripping step between protocols was, again, EDTA for 20 minutes uh, at 100 degrees C as well. So it was kind of nice that we were able to use our antigen retrieval step uh, in between protocols as the stripping step as well. And I'll just note that this staining was performed on the Lycabond RX. And so, of course, the citrate buffer is the ER1 buffer, and the EDTA buffer is the ER2 buffer. Um, I'll also note that the, um, the application note that I showed when I first started this section was of staining of CD8 and PDL1. And that describes uh, manual uh, dual-plex IHC assay. And that is available on the CFT website, and I'll provide a uh, link to that uh, shortly. Um, but th the key point is that it's, it's not necessarily the, the assay type, whether it's manual or automated. I think what we're trying to, to get across here is just the, the process and the, and the thought process and the steps to take in optimizing an assay. So it's more the, um, the thinking about how to go about uh, optimization rather than uh, the specific steps and, you know, how many washes between steps and things like that. Um, any questions like that, you can always get in touch with us uh, here at CSD for the specifics. So just to conclude, as we've discussed, uh, infiltrating myeloid cells constitute a significant component of the suppressive tumor microenvironment. Um, Arginase and IDO monoclonal antibodies provide insight into the mechanisms of immunosuppression within the tumor microenvironment. Um, highly validated IHC-grade antibodies are the building blocks for every multiplex assay format. And finally, optimization of fluorescent and, multi and chromogenic multiplex panels requires rigorous validation and robust controls. And so I hope I've gotten that across to you today, and I just want to uh, finish with a few resources that we have at CST. So I've got links here for uh, cell signaling technical support. Um, we're a great resource here, uh, technical support-wise. Um, you know, if you send us an email, if you call us up, you're not just going to talk to someone in customer service who's reading through a manual. You're going to be able to talk to the scientists who optimized these IHC assays, who developed these antibodies. So we really have a wealth of knowledge to offer and can um, get into the specifics of not only the assays that I discussed today, but also troubleshooting of any issues uh, you've had. And that goes for all of our applications, not just IHC, not just IHC, things like IF, um, Flow, and Western Blot as well. Uh, the next link will bring you to some of the multiplex IHC posters and application notes that I discussed earlier. Um, we have posters that have been presented at uh, a number of different conferences. Uh, this past year at AACR, we presented the, the poster detailing the mouse reactive uh, immune markers that I discussed earlier. And then the, the final link here is to the dual staining IHC application note that I showed an image of but uh, uh, failed to mention specifically at the beginning of the, the dual staining section. Um, as I said uh, just a minute ago, that application note details uh, the development of an assay of CD8 and PDL1. These are our human reactive antibodies for those targets um, in the manual setting. But the the uh, the way to go about the assay is kind of the most important thing in that application note. And again, any specifics you need about that assay, um, you can just uh, follow the link to the uh, IC technical support. Um, and I I'm going to leave it there. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, joining in today. And I'll open it up to any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the answer a question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. 
so let's let's get started with our with our first question. Um, do you have any mouse antibodies or established panels for mouse tissue? Uh, yes, that's a good question. So we do actually have a number of uh, mouse reactive antibodies. So we generally will develop um, antibodies raised in rabbit for use in mouse tissues. And we have a number of those, uh, a lot of new ones that are focused on uh, immuno-oncology uh, targets in the mouse. And actually, we recently presented, as I mentioned, I think, we recently presented a poster at AACR um, about our newest uh, multiplex IHC panel, which is focused on mouse reactive products. And that panel contains markers for CD3, Epsilon, PD1, CD8, PDL1, uh, F480, which is a pan macrophage marker in mice, and then pan keratin as a, a tumor marker. And um, that panel is available on the CSP website. It's under the uh, the poster section. And anyone interested who is not able to to locate that poster, um, you can email into uh, technical support, and I'll be happy to provide that link for you. Now, Chris, our next our next question is. Where does the steric hindrance come from, the antibody or the teromab reaction? Yeah, this is a good question. Um, it's still a bit unclear. It's something that I think people are beginning to realize is a variable that has to be considered uh, in this type of multiplex assay. Um, I, I, my thought is that the, the steric hindrance is coming from uh, the tyramide itself being deposited onto the proteins. And so I think that you can run into issues here where you have things that are um, expressed on, on smaller cell types, such as T cells, and different markers that are expressed um, in high concentration on the membrane, such as CD3 and CD8. And I think that the tyramide being deposited uh, onto the, the proteins themselves can block the binding of an antibody coming in you know, after the first one. Um, I, I believe that the, the antibodies themselves are, are quite small and, and wouldn't be an issue uh, steric hindrance-wise. Now, like I said, it's still unclear, you know, um, exactly what, what the issue might be, but my guess would be that it's, it's the tyramide reaction causing it. And we, we've messed around with a few different conditions, um, such as, as I mentioned, switching up the order of staining. But another thing you could attempt if you're having issues with, with a, a panel of your own is that you could um, you could use less tyramide, so that you know in theory would would help with any steric hindrance um, that you encounter. Chris, I work in a preclinical setting with a lot of mouse models. Can you describe how to get around mouse on mouse cross reactivity issues? Uh, sure. So um, as I mentioned with our mouse reactive panel, um, most of our, our primary antibodies are raised in rabbit. And so when you're using rabbit antibodies um, in mouse tissues, you won't see any mouse on mouse reactivity. Now I know a lot of other companies are raising their antibodies in mice, and that's gonna lead to issues um, with your mouse secondary reacting with um, IgG uh, within the mouse tissue. But when you're using rabbit antibodies, you won't run into any mouse on mouse reactivity. Um, and, and, you know, this, this is really helpful in the, the multiplex setting because, you know, as, as I mentioned with the tyramide-based assay, we can use antibodies raised in the same species. So being able to use a number of different rabbit antibodies uh, within mouse tissues uh, is, is helpful in this situation. Now, Chris, how do you test the antibody stripping? So to test the stripping in the uh, tyramide-based assay, what we do is we'll stain the tissue or we'll, we'll stain the tissue with our, you know, antibody of choice. Then we'll use the uh, tyramide conjugated fluorophore that we um, anticipate using in the panel. Then what we'll do is we'll uh, do a complete stripping step. We'll come back in with uh, diluent only, so no secondary antibody, or no uh, second primary antibody. And then we'll stain uh, the tissue with a different fluorophore. And then what we'll do is we'll image and see uh, what, what colors are present. So let's say we had a, our first primary, which was CD8 stained with a uh, 50. And then we stripped 
and then we came in with a Psi 5, let's say, conjugated tyramide. So if the stripping was complete, that Psi 5 wouldn't be able to bind. So under the microscope, we would see only the Fitzy yellow signal and no red Psi 5 signal. If the stripping was incomplete, then you would see uh, some of that red Psi 5 signal where the CD8 um, antibody is because it hasn't fully been stripped. So that's usually what we'll do. We'll stain with a primary antibody, one color tyramide, do a stripping step, then a second tyramide, and then we'll image. And if we see any color from that uh, second fluorophore tyramide conjugate, we'll know that the stripping step wasn't sufficient and we have to either change the stripping buffer or increase the, the heating time. Now, how do you deal with autofluorescence? Well, here at CST, we're using the Perkin Elmer system. So we have the Mantra microscope um, and the Inform software. And so with, with that scope and software combination, we're able to do uh, multispectral imaging. So multispectral imaging allows us to um, subtract any of that autofluorescence before we actually image um, the, the fluorophores and the antibodies within our panel. So that makes it really easy to deal with autofluorescence because you can just subtract it out uh, before the imaging and get a nice clean image. Now, if you don't have if you don't have um, a multispectral system, um, you're probably going to be limited to three or four colors, but that's okay. Um, I've worked with that as well, doing a four color assay uh, without multispectral imaging, and I found that the the tyramide really amplifies the signal so much that you can um, get a nice signal without seeing any autofluorescence. So basically the tyramide allows you to work with very small exposure times, which kind of eliminates uh, any autofluorescence within the tissue. Now our next, our next question is, what are the advantages of the tyramide system compared to the side-off system Hyperion from Fluidine? Yeah, that's another good question. Um, the Hyperion system from Fluidime certainly has its advantages in that you can do up to, I think, something like 40 different antibodies in a panel, um, which is great. I think, you know, there's still some questions about how to analyze all that data and what type of things um, you want to look at with, with up to 40 different antibodies. Um, but that system is very expensive, and you need to buy a whole new instrument. With the tyramide-based assay, um, it's you know a lot more cost-effective and a lot easier to implement in one's laboratory. So I think that while with the Hyperion system you can use you know up to 40 antibodies in, in on one tissue section, um, it's not going to be cost-effective for for every lab. And now I think with the tyramide-based system and with multispectral imaging, you can get up, get up to about nine different antibodies plus DAPI. So that's a 10-color assay, um, which, which I think just came out. So, you know, it's, it certainly is not able to handle the, the number of different targets in one panel, but it is a lot more uh, cost-effective. And I'll also mention that uh, here at CST, we don't have the Hyperion system, so we have not tested our antibodies in-house but we have heard from a number of customers that um, our antibodies work really well with the Hyperion system and that um, our recommended manual IHC dilutions usually um, transfer over pretty well to uh, the dilutions that people are using in the Hyperion panel. So it's important to note that you know, if, if anyone listening either has the Hyperion system or is thinking about it, um, CSD antibodies are, are a good choice for, for that uh, panel construction as well. And Chris, it looks like we have time for one more question. Are there particular markers you would recommend to better differentiate pro from anti-inflammatory myeloid cells? Uh, yes. So I discussed some of them in the uh, presentation today. Um, we talked about using arginase 1, of course, and IDO as uh, functional markers. Um, as more phenotypic markers, uh, some suggestions I have for um, the anti-inflammatory M2-like macrophages. Um, one would be CD206, of which we have an antibody for. Obviously, the classic M2 marker, CD163. Um, CD204 is another option. And then TG, or sorry, T, TGM2 is something people have been using recently. 
Um, M1 markers are a little harder to come by, but some possibilities that people might want to think about would be INOS, uh, CXCL10, and SOCS1 as possibilities. And then another option would be to use uh, a pan macrophage marker such as CD68 in a multiplex assay. So if you use CD68 and CD163, what you can do is you can take your CD68, CD163 dual positive cells and subtract those from your total population of CD8 or CD68 positive cells. And the number you're left with there will give you your will give you a, a pretty good estimate of the, the M1 macrophages uh, within your tissue. Thank you, Chris. Do you have any final comments for our audience? Um, I think that pretty much sums it up. I'd just like to thank everyone for uh, listening in today. And again, if you have any uh, follow-up questions, please feel free to write in to our uh, technical support or call in. Um, all that information is in, in the link that I had on my last slide there and is available on the CST website. Um, and if you just mentioned that you watched the webinar, you can talk to me directly You know, if you have any, any specific questions. And uh, thanks again. Thank you again, Chris, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank Labert and our sponsor, Cell Signaling Technology, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information that you provided at the time of registration. This webcast will be viewable on demand through April of 2019. Labrits will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Thanks again for joining us. Until next time, goodbye.